2011 from ANU. And since then, she's gone on to be extremely productive. She has had exhibitions and residencies in Japan, Germany, Singapore. <laughs> and this is her third solo exhibition with us. She's won the Cox Prize for Sculpture at Sculpture on the Edge in 2013. Last year, she was the winner of the Shire Reese Canberra Residency Award. Hi, And so I'll let Hannah start this talk off with her slides and we'll give you it. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you very much, Claire. I just wanted to thank um, Clinton's Lane Gallery for having me again um, and all the family and friends who have come <laughs> here today. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming. Um, I wanted to, um, I thought I'd sort of set the scene by explaining where my artwork fits in the context of contemporary drawing practice. Um, I'll, be, I'll begin to speak briefly about two artists whose, um, my, whose work informs my own. So this is a uh, work, a drawing um, work of egos. Perhaps the most, the single most important forecomer, forerunner to my own work pioneer of the notion of drawing in space is Vigo. Vigo was a, a German Jewish artist working in Latin America in the 1960s, 1970s. She is best known for her drawings without paper, which, project, which projected line into space, stripping away the supportive ground of paper. Displaying here is one of her classic two-dimensional drawings. As, as you can see, it remains very connected and contemporary and is concerned with the formal properties of line. This, temp this formal concern may reflect her training as an architect. But in the 60s, Ego made the leap from these drawings on paper into three dimensions. She used wire extensively as a three-dimensional drawing material to make drawings without paper. You can see from this piece, she remains very much concerned with literal and geographic properties, but freed from the limitations of the plane. In my own practice, Hugo has been an important starting point. Why has become perhaps the most important material from our own visual expression, the material the material language in which I'm, I feel most fluent. All other aspects of my work are informed in some way to my wire work, as I describe later. Monica Jamala is another contemporary artist whose drawing practice has informed my work. She is currently living and working in Berlin. Jamala is pushing Diego's three-dimensional practice further using different materials to draw in space, like a, adhesive tape and handmade paper. Although, people, although Jamala's work is generally cyclistic and ephemeral, she regards her, her practice as drawing and she shares Hugo's concern for the formal qualities of line. Indeed, she has come up with the phrase spatial, spatial drawing to describe her work. Her spatial drawings are on the scale of the room. In one sense, when viewing her work, you enter into the drawing it is a bodily confrontation. Jamala sees herself as working in the tradition of Hugo. She has taken Hugo's starting point in a new direction, however, broadening the scope of what drawing can do for the next generation of artists working with line. This is the work um, that she, the black work is the tape, the adhesive tape that she spreads across the scale of the room and out onto the structural elements of the, of the uh, pillars of the room. I have been um, fortunate enough to have undertaken two mentorships with Monica in Berlin over the last two years. In this slide you can glimpse her experimentation inside her studio. 
While, while I have learned many practical skills from her, more importantly, I have been able to observe her approach to making. I, I was also fortunate to have the chance to get critical feedback on my own practice for my, um, for my, um, from my solo exhibition in Berlin last year. While in Berlin, Monica challenged me to experiment with the new materials. She suggested that I that I work with more of, more of a signi with her signature material of tape and to work in a, in a larger scale, more gestural scale, to see what would come out from this process. I also wanted to explore how I can make my own drawings more immersive. As a result, I started to make large-scale drawings that transform a gallery space into an artwork rather than merely housing one. This is one of my drawings that I did in Canberra a few years ago. So I occupied the whole gallery space and transformed it. So when you when you walk into the gallery space, you're physically walking into the drawing itself. So there were nine um, large-scale um, paper works on the walls that you can barely see. Um, and every day I would walk into the the drawing and draw the shadows of the wire. So there's wire drawings on top of the paper as well as floating to the ceiling. And each day I'll change the lights in the gallery space and trace the shadows. So every day it would be like a transforming drawing. And the floor is covered with pool salt. These works can only be temporal, a moment in time, leaving only a memory. The element of time, permanence and rhythm have become increasingly important to me. To that end, I have been trying to extend my drawing practice into, into four dimensions of time. I recently have begun collaborating with dancers who extend my drawing my a young father with her, his two little boys drawing in the sand. <laughs> so it was, it was very exciting um, being in the gallery space and drawing every day because the, the audience would come in and interact with the space and draw with it. And it was, it was lovely because sometimes they wouldn't even know that I was the artist and they were just sort of occupied through it. And when it, it became so physical, like some adults, I'd find them lying on the salt <laughs> doing this and um, that's like, yeah, the snow angels. And it was just so beautiful because like they would never do that in a gallery space normally. And I'll just, and it's attached to a coffee shop, so often I'd be outside having coffee and just sort of watching what people do. Uh, but this was so beautiful, just a father with a 50 little boy. So he, here you can see the, highlight of the paper and the shadows. Um, and when, when I removed the wire off the wall, it was just like the memory of what it used to be, just the pencil drawings. So this is a, um, this is a show that I did in um, over three weeks in um, a, a remote place in Fukuoka in Japan. Um, and it took me two weeks to create all the materials. So this is this is me at the entrance, um, and the gallery space was an old rice paddy stor uh, storage. And um, through the tape is wire, so I can weave and twist and draw the tape and it would hold its form. And after two weeks, it became so immersive it was almost like entering a thick jungle. Um, as you can see, you can barely walk through it. Um, and after two weeks we had an opening and just by conversations um, and translators I started talking to two young dancers and through that interaction um, we suggested perhaps um, in a week's time after I transformed the drawings um, every day they'll come in and rehearse with me and I said yeah, this can be a place in which you can draw it and interact with what I've done and they said how can you dance in this because they were ballet dancers. I said, I can transform it to fit the movements you want to make. Um, so after collaborating with them, the gallery looked like this. Um, and the floor, um, it was just 
round earth floor site covered with um, coats of paper and then through the shadows of um, the drawing above. Um, and this is one of the dancers. So you can see it was quite lovely um, collaborating with them because as they would dance, the, the arms would spread out and if they would spin, they would spin into the drawing so I'd wrap around them and twist it up so to create more <laughs> room for them. Uh, so it became quite architecture and it's lovely in the sense of when you're collaborating with people, I would have never planned to have done that work without them but by accidentally working with them it turned into something new that wouldn't have happened without um, both of us working together. Um, so the next work is um, the memory of that movement and what they did is stored in the next 
mixed work. Um, so I've, I've left the holes where the where it sat, where the head was, and where they met as a memory of where um, their bodies used to be. Um, while while I'm very much while, while I very much like the idea of temporal drawing, I am also very interested in the idea of permanence in art objects. Hannah Arendt wrote that art objects are unique in that their durability is of a higher order than that which all, need, all things need in order to exist at all. They can attain permanence throughout the ages. So this work here is showing how my practice, depending on what I'm willing to achieve, pushes myself into uh, new materials to suggest different things. So this is an exhibition showing the light and the fragility. The, the back piece is called um, Unfolding, um, Unraveling, and it's hand-printed, embossed liner prints wrapped around wire and floating just sort of off the wall and out into the next space. Um, and there's a piece, and so that's just a piece that was constructed specifically for that show in that space. Um, and the work in front of it, um, unfolding um, his hand forged steel sculpture. So they're responding to each other, but one's very temporal, um, only existing for a few days, and the other one will remain for years to come. The, hit, the issues of fragility and strength explain why I, I am interested in another spatial element, scale. Large scale work, whether two dimensional or three dimensional, forces the human body into a direct relationship with the piece. Large scale works have mass and occupy space. They can assert, assert a physicality that cannot be denied. They, can, they are labor intensive and by nature confrontational, challenging the viewer through physical proximity. So this is a detailed piece of the Lino drawing. Another issue in my practice is the crucial relationship between two and three dimensional drawings and how they, um, how they relate. To that end, I have developed a, a serial strategy of making across multiple media my process begins, if such a process can be said to have a beginning, with the creation of a spatial drawing, the extension of line into three dimensions, using materials like wire, steel, and tape. This line transformed by shadow and refracted light formed the visual cases for two-dimensional drawings, which then itself perform, provides a platform for further spatial drawings. By oscillating between the plane and the void, my art practice consists of an extended parameters in space and time, a conversation between the ground and the line, which, se which separates the idea from its existence. Because of this, my work are not one-offs, but stand, that stand alone. They, they have an ancestry or, or family history. So just to go, uh, oh, this is a this is a piece I made um, in the Pilbara for that residency. So it's hand forged steel <coughs> sculpture. Um, it's hard to get a sense of the scale, but um, I want it. It's in three halves, and um, with me standing up, with my hands up, the, the the height of it is like that. So you still walk through, and I, it's like the break of a river splitting in half. So you can walk through it and then around it, and you can see. The shadows even in the um, outside is very much part of the work and changes um, responding to the change throughout the day. So just to go through, that's a detail at the top, um, how my practice works. So first it's the steel sculpture on top that branches out to different possibilities that create other possibilities. So just to show that sort of sense of a family tree. Um, so I just go through these If you have any questions, uh, often I, even though the one in the Pilbara was so heavy, you needed about seven um, people to carry it. Um, usually before that piece, I would always make them the size to fit through doors, but also the size that I could physically 
carry it myself mm. and then weave them together um, in, the, in the site. Um, so I'll just go through these quickly. So you can see even with the um, paperwork, I cut them and so they, they end up making their own um, shadows on the wall. Okay, this is my latest work for the exhibition called Transfer. My most recent um, experiment, Transfer, is an attempt to flatten some of the branches of the family tree. I, I was provoked um, in this direction by seeing the work of Jesus Soto in, in Paris last year. He famously created optical works where wire placed in front of a stripy canvas causes a shimmering and a vibrational effect. So you can see, up, well, this is the work on this black wall, so from a distance you would just think it's a flat um, two-dimensional painting, but it's only when approaching it you realise it's a three-dimensional work on top of it. So you can see the shadows that are spreading across in, into space. Um, to show you Soto's work, this is, oh, that's a detail. This is one of Soto's work, so in front is a wire sculpture sitting on top of a painting. In, um, in a form by his approach, um, in transfer, I've tried to combine two related but distinct elements and fuse them into a single artwork. I hope that this will make my process more visible. The process of making is important to this investigation. Making reveals to me insights about my own process or recollection that would otherwise be in, in, inaccessible. As William Kentridge states, it is only when physically engaged on a drawing that ideas start to emerge. There is a combination between drawing and seeing, between making and assessing, that provokes a part of my mind that otherwise is closed off. Thank you very much for coming. Perfect time to ask them. No pun intended, but where do you draw the line between drawing dimensionally and sculpture? For me, um, anything that I can create a line with is a drawing. So material, there's no um, separation for me with material. So if I can draw with fabric, with steel, anything that I can make a line with, make a mark with, even as you can see with the human body in space. For me, it's not a dance, it's a drawing. How did you find yourself interacting with the landscape before? Um, well, for me, often um, the site in which the work is made um, obviously um, it's becomes, it affects how I am, but also affects the work itself. So um, in the Pilbara, I traveled a lot, and a lot of my work that I made during that two month uh, residency was inspired um, by being at Marble Park Falls where there's beautiful landscapes of rippling um, lion and rock and it's kind of like the history of the site that was created there so all of the lions were and it was um, so supporting on the banks of the river so that's why I was wanting to create a sculptural form that it was almost as if you were walking along the banks of the river, but instead of the rocks being flat that you walk on top of them, I lifted them up so they were so crazy. Um, and the imagery of the line so was inspired by the surface. Um, and it was only by being there that, and by, you know, when you start to physically engage with the space without knowing the whole, either scientific um, or historical context of the site, um, I started in my artist talk I started talking to a, um, a scientist who worked in that region and he, she said it's interesting that you work with steel because and, and rust and water because that how the rocks were made was how the earth would move and the colours of the red and why it would be rusty. So I'm hoping that the sculpture will sit in that place and be um, overly years and years dissolved into rust. Um, and 
another work that was made during that residency, um, this broken hill, which is on the back wall. Um, it, I was living very close to the mine at Newman, and in the early mornings I'd go walking before I'd start work, and it's only one hill that separates where I was living and the mine. And if you'd walk on the other side, the air was so full with dust from the mine that like, you could barely breathe. And when I walked up to see the mine, it was just like this empty porch that was just not like the field wasn't there anymore. And that's why that works for this broken field because it's like sort of it's missing. Um, so um, often like my my own memories and experiences affect my work, but also the setting where it's been made and what's happening around me as well. So, yeah. Heather, I like when you, I was asking, I really like the work and your work, and you mentioned that it was like your evening activity to do sitting yeah. on top of your double bed. Yes. And then when I see it in the gallery, it's such a large scale, really powerful work. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, it's sort of like the individual details that kind of relating to weaving and things that you might imagine doing on a bed? Like, how do you kind of step back yeah. and get a sense of the scale as it's been? Um, well, yeah, I do hand forging for like 10 hours a day from morning to as long as I could with well, my arms full of, and then as my relaxation, I was working on the broken wheel. So I was living in a very small little room that the only place I could work was my double beds. And uh, so that's why that shape of the <laughs> work is very much a double bed. And usually, all of my other two um, sculptural wire pieces are made on my kitchen table in the middle of the room so I walk around it so I can get every perspective and look down at it. But that one, because I was cross-legged, I could only work on like a very <laughs> seat, so I'd have to stand up and go, what's happening here? You know? um, and at night when I'd go to sleep, I was, you know those old-fashioned um, hat stands? I'd hook it on the hat stand and gradually over the course of the month, it would get heavier and heavier, so I was like, the hat stand was sort of like, struggling a lot. But yeah, it's a sense of weaving through different things that are inspiring and what influence, you know. That sense of, as William Kentridge said, it's something, making is almost like you go into a different state that you forget that you're tired or you're hungry or anything else. It's almost like a trance and um, that sense of time can completely change. So, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering also how do you think your experience sort of growing up in Indigenous communities and working at art centres and things, has that um, inspired you making connections with um, Indigenous artists? Yeah, as, as I showed, there's, there's lots of people who work with line and, um, and black and white imagery. I think the sense of probably who I am as a person more than the other has influenced me. Um, and um, I think by being um, sort of in the landscape in a sense, yeah. 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 Connection with the landscape. Um, well, sort of in the settings in which things are made in a way, like I think um, certain pieces I make them for where they'll be showing. Um, and um, if I weren't in that setting, I would never make them in a way. Yeah. Is that it? Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate it.